Synthaholics, this is your host, Aaron O'Brien. Uh, Holly is away, Dave Duncan is away, but I do have the most amazing guest right now with me, the one and only Guy Davis. Hello! From Geek Tank and the Tamberlin, and uh, you you have a long list of uh, many amazing things that you are always got your fingers in. Yeah, and, and you know, people always say that I should wash my hands more before I put my fingers in things. I, I don't know. You should. You should. You know, yes. it's just a thing. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so, so cleanly of you to wash. Yes. Um, so uh, what have you been up to? I, you, we were talking just before uh, you're getting ready for your big con out there in Denver. Yes, we've got uh, Nandes Con coming up here in um, uh, next week, I, and, and it's, uh, it's an anime convention. And that's on the what is it the twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth? I think that's nice. yeah. That's this week. Yeah, twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Um, it's the largest anime convention in the Rocky Mountain region, which you know is it's pretty huge. And um, so that's that's gonna be fun. A little stressful right now. Uh, I'm, sure. I, I somehow I, I'm the archivist because I'm one of the few people left who've been there since the very beginning wow. and so they drafted me into the board of directors by saying hey you could uh, run the archive and I was like oh that sounds like fun and they're like but you have to be a director <laughs> and I'm like wait <laughs> so I ended up getting drafted um, and so I feel kind of like McCoy you know right. r- r- little known scarcely talked about reserve activation clause in other words, in other words they drafted I'm, me. They drafted me. <laughs> so, Bones, um, I need you. I need you. <laughs> There's something out there. There's always. Why is there always why something? Is there I, I don't know about it called a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So you. Uh, so so yeah. You're you've been drafted, and now you're uh, in the middle of it. I'm in the middle of it, and I've got seven divisions, two of which are on fire right now. And at least the rest of them have calmed down. So I think we're about ready to get everything rolling right out, and we should be good. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, I'm writing Witches of Flame. It's a very large script, which has become bigger than I expected, but mm. it's going to be a lot better than I expected. Um, awesome. So I... I I have 21 uh, issues that will be, when it's completed, it'll be 21 issues long, 21, 24 page issues. Nice. Um, and it's going to cover the entire arc of this one character. And I'm just going back and forth with it now and tying everything together. And now explain explain to the audience if they don't uh, if they haven't heard you before uh, the premise of which is flinch. I know what it is, and I've seen the artwork. It, it's some of the artwork that you put out, and it's really beautiful. But let them, let them know what it's about. Right. So, which is a flame is an alternate history comic book that I'm writing, which uh, follows which which is under the premise of suppose we didn't stop at Apollo 17, but mm-hmm. rather continued on because we had received a signal from Mars. Which, you know, an alien signal from Mars. So Congress didn't stop the Apollo program, but rather started up the Ares program as well. And nice. continued everything to go on to Mars. And it follows the first seven female astronauts, American astronauts, that would have been inducted in in 1971 and 72. Cool. So I, I get to include a lot of the stories that I have picked up through the years from our actual female astronauts. Um mm-hmm. 
and I'm including a whole bunch of interesting side things. And I'm trying to figure out who's going to get to Mars first, me or NASA, because I'm, I'm, you know, NASA keeps saying they're going to get to Mars, they're going to get to Mars, and I'm like, really? I think I'm going to beat you there at this point in time. Um, because even though this is taking me forever to write, it seems like it's taking NASA even longer to get there. Well, so, you can't rush art, and you can't rush a trip to the Mars. So I, you know, I guess not. Um, yeah. But I've got I've been researching heavily the real science, all of its real science in there. Um, I've I've been going through. There's some amazing stuff that I have found in my research that's just astonishing. That it's still just, uh, I'm just like, I can't believe that we didn't do this. We had nuclear rockets, and Mm. they could have done a direct, Mars direct, like straight from here to Mars in one shot. It would have taken a little over, uh, um, it would have taken a little over like 10 days to get to Mars at, at, uh, when they're, when, when the two planets are together. And we dumped that, that engine design because of budget cuts. (laughs) <laughs> really, and so now we're doing Honeman transfers, which is where we just effectively go ballistic, and it takes nine months to get to Mars. Yeah. Right, and I I'm know like, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm like, wow, we had the technology, we were there, and we totally we had the technology from 1950. We were working on it, and you know, a lot of those technology and a lot of that stuff um, is forgotten now, or has not been thought about, or or even. Recreated since yeah. I, I think I, I think I read or, or was it uh, I heard on NPR or something that they were trying to uh, fix uh, uh, what is it the um, uh, the actual rockets uh, where the flame comes out that cup that comes around it for the engines they were trying to fix it or repair it and they just couldn't do it the way they used to you, oh yeah, the the bells in the F one on the F ones and on the uh, Saturn. Yes, one? yes, they couldn't. They they didn't know how to do that anymore. It's so they, because they, each and every F one engine was individually built. Yeah, and that's what they're saying. And that even though they have schematics, they don't have the knowledge of how they actually created it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those they people are long built. gone. Yeah, and all the people who built them are long since gone. And it's. It's, it's like they built rockets the way my grandmother used to make cooking. A pinch of this, a pinch of that. You know, it's like, hmm. So <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of that going on. Um, yeah. And there, and there was and a lot of stuff that was weird. Um, and, you know, and reading into all this stuff, you know, the movie Apollo 13, there's a mm-hmm. scene where, uh, it, you know, during the launch sequence, one of the engines cuts out and, okay. and everything like that. Well, that actually really happened. Because of a thing they called Pogo, um, hmm. what was happening was the inboard number five engine kept flexing. It flexed in and out during the launch sequence, which caused it to break its fuel lines. Oh Jesus! Because they didn't know that it was interfering. The sound waves were interfering with the other four <laughs> engines. So they managed to. I mean, it was okay. They only really needed that fifth engine to get it off the ground. But it still was like, you know, they just didn't know. They had no idea. And they right. didn't quite figure out what the pogo was happening until Skylab. They weren't even sure what was going on because it, it took a whole bunch of just figuring it out. I found wow. out about the Russians and their their moon rockets. I mean, the, the N1, which was the Russians' version of the moon rockets, they literally kept blowing them up. One of the one of them blew up so much it was the largest explosion on Earth that wasn't nuclear in the history oh of man. Oh my god! Because it just exploded. It rolled over on its side during launch and then blew up. And when it did, Whoa. it was the biggest explosion on Earth, save a nuclear blast. And it was like, I mean, all of this stuff. This is what happened in our space program, and it's like people don't know this stuff, but it really happened. It's like Un- it's unbelievable. That's some cool stuff. And uh, so, uh, you, uh, well, you, you're not uh, okay. Let me just back up. Uh, if people don't know, also, you have uh, prolific work with uh, doing the USS Tamberlin, which is kind of how I got to know you. Yes. Was you have an online. Uh, uh, Star Trek based comic on uh, the ship called the Tamberlin, and uh, you have it, uh, just a ton of stories that you that you told. Um, so, th- but your Witches of Flames you are not releasing like online as a web comic, correct? 
I will be at some point. It's just not there yet. So you can okay. find all of this on mm-hmm. gsdavisart.com. Okay. Cool. Um, and if Very you go nice. up there, you can see USS Tamerlan. It's just up in the header there. And I've got nice. all of them in there. And it's just a zillion pages. A zillion pages, right? Yeah, they, he has quite a lot of work. It's uh, it, it's pretty cool. So definitely check that out, especially if you're a Star Trek fan. And, uh, of course, uh, n- when you're not doing cons, when you're not doing Witches of Flames, when you're not um, you know doing any other art project, you also are a podcast, uh, the, the Geek Kit Tank. Right. So, Let yeah, them know where they can find that. Okay, you can find us uh, at RockyMountainGeekTank.com. Um, you can also find all of this on Facebook under those same names, too. I mean, I've, I've got uh, you know, RockyMountainGeekTank.com um, is where we are on uh, Facebook, and we're a geek culture podcast there, too. So yeah. we meet every Tuesday, uh, Thursday this season. We're starting Season 5 in two weeks. Nice. And uh, we'll be we do video podcasts from a Starbucks in a random location in Denver. It's not really random. It's just kind of a weird location. It's at First and Wadsworth, which means nothing, nothing. to anybody who doesn't unless live you're in from that area. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to come walking through that door while you're recording, and he'll be like. Dude, it's so good to see you. <laughs> I know it's going to be awesome. Um, but uh, so, Guy has graciously uh, come onto our show, and we're going to talk more about Picard. And this one, I felt, was an important episode. Uh, we just covered uh, Best of Both Worlds, Part One and Two. Um, we are doing Family, which is the third of that trilogy. They most people consider that the unof- unofficial third installment of the Borg trilogy. Yeah, you don't you don't really get. I mean, it's kind of just a wrap up, but you're also getting what the psychology of Picard afterward. That this really this really messed him up quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, he's trying to make sense of it. So um, well, Michael Piller had actually wanted to do that, I and mean, that was his specific statement because um, he had said that even though you know he he actually called up Rick Berman and said, "I know that we don't really." do this but effectively Picard was raped he can't just yeah. go back to work the next day <laughs> you can't just have him do that <clears throat> just if you take, keep taking those pills right I mean it's like so the whole thing was that Pillar wanted to do something that at least addressed it Yeah, that at yeah. least brought that I mean it's like said something about it Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Um, I so this is before we start recording. Uh, I was saying this is one of my favorite episodes, but I get really emotional when I watch this episode, so I don't watch it a lot. So, uh, but I still love this episode. I think it's so well done. So, I'm excited to talk about it and uh, to explore it a little bit. Yeah, and whereas I was saying that. It's not one of my top tens. It's not one of my favorites. Um, and it's not... I don't, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I, I have to be like... But you come down from Best of Both Worlds 1 and 2, which was such a high point. And, and this one, I think the, the, that I really... I, I have a... I think my biggest problem is the relationship between Jean-Luc and Rene. I think mm-hmm. I, is my biggest problem with this one. Um, I, I feel like that's, that's where I have, I don't know, it, maybe it feels forced to me. I don't know. So maybe you should go on ahead and give the briefing on it so we can talk about it. So, cause I, I don't want to analyze it before you've given the briefing on the episode. Yeah. I, I'll, so we're doing a, just a kind of quick, uh, quick run through, um, these, for these episodes. I, we're going to kind of focus more on the card side of it, but if you want to talk about like the war side or Wesley side or anything, you know, feel free to, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, so this is, uh, family. This is next generation, uh, season four, episode two in this first aired October 1st, 1990. Uh, so Enterprise is at a uh, dry dock after the Borg um, attack, and they're just ships getting fixed, and crews all taking time off, and they're refitting the ship, and all that stuff. Uh, obviously, I said before, Worf is getting his families coming in town, uh, Sergei and Helena uh, Rachenko. They are, uh, or Rozchenko, and they're coming to visit, and he doesn't really like that idea. 
But whatever, Worf, they're your parents. They're going to come see you. And uh, during that time, Picard uh, decides he's going to come back home to the place of his birth, the town of his birth. And uh, we have a quick little interchange between uh, Troy and Picard. And she, I, I don't know why she had to kind of, you know, I don't, uh, kind of, it wasn't teasing him, but kind of like, you know, oh, why did you decide to go uh, back to your hometown and stuff like that? And Picard's like, it's kind of like place of my origin. And after what I went through, it seemed like a good place to start to get grounded again. Um, so it was kind of a, I felt that it was kind of weird that Troy was teasing him a bit. I don't know. I thought that was odd. Well, if Troy can pick up on the nuance, mm-hmm. I think that really what I think she's picking up on is that, you know, that why would you go back to a place where there's obvious conflict? True. Very true. But, uh, you know, family is where you started. And sometimes, I don't I mean, that's good. Sometimes point. it's like, a touchstone. You, yeah, it's a touchstone. Um uh, I yeah, mean, he could have just. He, I always he could read, have gone to a beach somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I read that when I when I read the when I mean, when I when I read Troy on this one, Troy reads as so you just came back from conflict and you're going back to conflict. Seems interesting to me. You know, that's the way I always read her on this one. So this was written by point. Ron Moore. So mm-hmm. I, I I mean, Ron Moore is excellent. So I don't have any problems with the writing on this one. Per se, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I have an overview problem with a character, but I don't have a problem with the writing individually. So I feel like uh, I feel like that Troy's reaction here is pretty okay, acceptable. I mean, it's I don't right, know. right. Um, I just thought it was odd, but that's in, you, you, now that you said that, it kind of puts it in a different light. I could sort of see what you're saying. Yeah, like that. He has he's had conflict with his his brother Robert before uh, Robert, and uh, you know I could see that. Yeah. Um, during that time, uh, right after Worf's parents arrive, and uh, of course uh, his father is very excited to see um, see the Enterprise, and then he also is. I mean, obviously they're excited to see Worf too as well. So, um, the next scene we have. Uh, Picard uh, walking down uh, a, a road and a dirt road, and um, he meets his uh, his his nephew uh, Rene, and uh, so they make their acquaintance. And uh, but Rene, being young, kind of spills the beans of how his father feels about him. Uh, he says he calls he what does it mean uh, arrogant son of a, and he goes, let's talk about that later. So we're we're uh, we're quite aware of that now that um, maybe things weren't great uh, between uh, Picard and his uh, family. Things aren't going so hot. Yeah. So he uh, uh, as he comes to uh, to the house that he grew up in, he meets his uh, sister in law Marie, which he's never met before. I guess they've only had. Um, correspondence towards each other and uh, Robert is uh, out uh, eating grapes off the vine and um, when he goes out to when he meets Marie she's very kind she's very sweet and she tells uh, Picard where Robert is and when he goes out to meet Robert in the vineyard he's kind of kind of cold to him doesn't have much to say you know it's just like well you know we're here just make yourself at home See you at dinner. Yeah. Good to see you. Hasn't been there in probably 20 years. Yeah, whatever. So Go go, yeah. go, go make yourself home. Whatever. Uh, next scene we have uh, Dr. Crusher. She uh, she gets an old box from uh, that she had in storage on Earth. And in that box uh, she gets a... Um, uh, there's a message from her father. I mean, not her father. Her husband, Jack, uh, to Wesley. Uh, Wesley's father, and they are going to. Um, she she wants to give it to him, so we have that. And then, uh, of course, uh, Worf's parents are making their rounds around um, the Enterprise. Uh, they have discussions with the Forge, and uh, uh, Worf's father has a lot of interest in the uh, warp engine, so he's talking to the Forge quite a bit. And uh, th- then we jump over to. Um, 
Picard uh, back at uh, back at this uh, house, and he meets his uh, old friend Lewis, who is a uh, head of the Atlantis pro- uh, project, which they're trying to raise a continent in the Atlantic Ocean uh, for more landmass, build houses. Yeah, I get you know because there's you know obviously there's just not enough space for the human race out here. Space being the operative word. Um, uh, isn't that the premise of uh, Superman Returns? Yeah. Lex yeah, Luthor yeah, tries to race. Like that. There was like a bad movie somewhere along the line. <laughs> he, he basically wanted to raise like a... like a, a What is this with Lex Luthor and continent changing? I know. Because I mean, it's like R- Superman, real estate. Superman, he was like trying to make continents go away. Yeah, he was trying to... Uh, the, the San Andreas Fault. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's trying to drop off California off the map so all that uh, real estate would be in the Rocky Mountains or whatever would be uh, would be the next uh, big thing that he bought. But anyways, um, Lewis doesn't seem as nefarious as Lex Luthor, and uh, <laughs> he he uh, he uh, him and John Luke were old friends and they have uh, a great little talk. But he. John Luke says that he kept up on the re, uh, what he was doing and been reading on the journals and stuff like that. And this kind of excites Lewis that maybe John Luke might want to become part of this project. So John Luke, uh, he says, yeah, you know, send me your, send me your reports. I'll re- look over them, you know. And, you know, he's kind of nonchalant about it, but Lewis is very excited. Uh, next, we get uh, a, a dinner between uh, the family uh, with Picard and Robert, Marie, and uh, um, their son, uh, Rene. And uh, there's a whole talk. Actually, just going back to our discussion on uh, making engines for rocket ships, uh, that uh, Robert feels that, you know, um, putting a, a replicator in the house is bad because you're going to lose something. You know the creation, the creating of something. You you'll lose that knowledge. Those values which humanity holds most precious. I know, and uh, yeah, then um, they have this whole uh, back and forth when um, uh, their son uh, uh, Renee at talks him about uh, his paper, how he got a good grade on it, and John Luke was like, "I don't remember what my grade was," and Robert is like, "You know, you got you got uh, high marks and." You could tell Rene is very bitter towards John Luke and and all the success that he's had. Right. So so um, so from there uh, we uh, go to the same uh, vineyard um, that uh, John Luke um, basically says that uh, he. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lewis says that he was. Uh, he, he going to have a uh, a meeting with a, a board of governors. I think he said for the Atlantis project, and they want to uh, they want to hear his ideas from it. And uh, Picard sort of is like, eh, I don't know, but he's like, all right, fine. And then he tells Marie later that uh, he's actually considering that maybe I'll work on the Atlantis project instead of going back to Starfleet and back to the Enterprise because they were using harmonic resonators for that, right? Because it's something yes. like the, uh, something about the, like Deneva 4, Deneva, uh, De- uh, Deneva, Demra, De- Demra, Demra. Oh, gosh, was it Drema 4? What was that? Yes. Yeah, that was, uh, I'm just that looking was, it up. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was, this was, this was from um, an episode earlier. Mm-hmm. So, it was this was this was you know used for the one with uh for when they were dealing with was it was it uh the episode with the girl the the with pen pals yeah, pen, pen, pen pals, pals. I, pen pals. Yeah, I think that i think it was the one i'm pen pals so it was pen pals wasn't it that that we, yeah, we saw pals. that situation before so there so ron moore is calling back to pen pals on this with drama four you know, it's actually quite amazing that this episode is making all these callbacks because Sarjenka. Uh, most of the time, that's who it was. Sarjenka, the girl. Could, could, yeah, because Sorry. most of those. Yeah, no, it's quick. Most of these episodes never reference past episodes. Maybe once in a while you get, but this like we're seeing a lot of callbacks. Right. Which I actually, I was actually pretty fond of, of Pen Pals. Pen Pals was an interesting, uh, interesting episode. I like that one. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's very good. Um, although he breaks the prime director. Pr- totally. Least, just or cracked. Data does. Oh, bam, bam, and then, bam. And then Picard goes along with it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, Which, of course, then goes with the Kirk breaks the prime directive all the time. I'm like, pen pals. I'm sorry, pen what? Pal. We did actually a, uh, I think a five parter on the prime directive. <laughs> And uh, we did. Uh, we broke down every episode, and if they broke the prime directive, it was like their fault or it wasn't their fault and stuff like that. And Picard, you know, he he has a share. You know, I mean, we we only get three seasons of the of Kirk, so but you know, Kirk breaks a lot, but Picard does too, right? So, and let's not even talk about Janeway. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, Janeway, Janeway has her own issues. Yes, so. yes. She broke a lot of it too. Uh, Cisco, not so much. Um, and we, and we didn't. No, not so much. He didn't really. No, no. Uh, he, you know. he really didn't. He didn't have a lot of opportunity. He, he was dealing with established warp capable cultures. He never really had to deal with Prime Directive much at all. Um, yeah, if you think about it, Cisco just never had the opportunity. Yeah, that's basically it. And then, um, I mean, it wasn't like Cisco wasn't above doing nasty things in the pale moonlight. Oh. But yes. um, <laughs> what Dave's, Dave's, Dave Duncan's favorite episode? I love that episode. I, I'm raising uh, my glass to you right now, Cisco. So <laughs> nefarious, so nefarious. It's all for wor- oh, universal peace. Um, so, uh, anyways, we get the uh, um, then we get to uh, back on the Enterprise Wharf and his parents, and we have a whole conversation with Worf's parents and Guinan. How uh, when he's at on at Ten Ford, he doesn't look towards the Klingon Empire; he lo- he's looking towards Earth as his home. So, right. Um, so that's the, you know it's it's sweet, I suppose. Uh, Worf has a is a big teddy bear, you know, deep down. Um, we knew that. <laughs> Somewhere anyway, the line they had to, that that Helena had to learn to cook red roquet blood blood pie blood pies. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, and then we go to Beverly gives Wesley the message from Jack, and uh, Wesley's uh, a little confused about it, but um, almost at the end we'll see Wesley upload the the program. So. Um, and then we also have Worf with his parents again, and basically saying that he's happy to that he, um, that their parents. He was hesitant when his parents first came aboard, but then later was like, "I'm happy you came." And the parents were like, "We heard about what happened with you and the Klingons, and how they dishonored you." And and uh, Worf was like, "No human could possibly understand what I'm going through." And the parents were like, "We don't care. We're with you. We just you know we just want you to, you, to be happy no matter what. You're our son." So. It's, it's interesting a, how much of this mirrors a lot of my experience that I have with Japanese culture. Really? I, I've noticed, I'm noticing a lot of, <laughs> it's kind of funny actually now that I look up, look at this. I, I have experienced very similar things as Worf does with, while interfacing with Japanese culture. Cause I was just were noticing. You, were you dishonored in Japanese? No, no, I wasn't. Japan? But, but I think about the, 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 you know, uh, Worf's mom, learning to cook red cake blood pie even oh, though they never right, learned right. to eat it which yeah, yeah. that I, I right now we've got a, a friend of the friend uh, one of my one of our ex-students when we were over there in Japan my wife and I were over in Japan and taught uh, English while we were for a while and we came back and now she's over here staying with us for a couple of weeks and she brought a whole bunch of food over and I'm watching mm-hmm. now as my son is like I don't even know what this is you know like half mm-hmm. this stuff because mm-hmm. it's all Japanese Sure, and, sure. and of course, we're eating it, going, "Oh, this is so you know nostalgic." Because I I remember eating this when we were there, but of course, you can't get it here in America, and so we're, <laughs> and we're eating it. And I'm realizing how much of this stuff like we'll make Japanese food here at our house because we were in Japan and we learned it and stuff like that. But it's similar. It's like we make this stuff, and then people are like, "Okay, wait a minute, what is in this?" And you're like, <laughs> "Like, well, okay." So it's got prunes and it's got some. Okay, so it's that seaweed, and you know you're like explaining it, and you're like, okay, I know it sounds gross, but you gotta Eels. try it, right? And it's like, you know, it is, and I start to realize just how much that sounds like it, 
And then I start to realize how many times I had heard, and you were just saying this, how many times I heard in Japan them saying, well, you're an American, it's hard for you to understand this, but you'll never really understand this because this is a Japanese culture thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. And how many times they said that to me? And I was like, I, we're not aliens. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's so, not like so you weird. are, it's not like you're, you know, a different species. <laughs> We can understand each other. Don't worry. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. We can figure it out. We can square it away. It's uh, so funny. Worf takes himself so seriously, though, you know. Well, and they do, too. (laughs) I I suppose you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And and now that I think about that, I'm like, I can see writing Klingons. Somebody has interfaced with one of these cultures who feels very much like this like oh you're an american you'll never understand our culture it's okay don't worry yeah 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 totally you know it's it's fine i mean we we understand i mean we're (laughs) kind of sad but we understand because it's the same words and i i never i never had the opportunity to look at it that way until now and now i'm suddenly going oh Ron obviously had either Japanese friends or Chinese friends or, or so, somebody some in the form, east, you know. in the mm-hmm. in the far east, who always looks at Americans and go, "Okay, you're Western. You're just not going to get this," you know. And of course, I, it doesn't take long to understand all of it. We can get it. <laughs> yeah, I, that's true. That's true. But maybe you don't have the deep seated emotions that are tied to it too. That's you true. Know, that's know, true. So. But it, it's not like we can't read it. You know. Yeah. The, Good point. But yeah, I thought it's still sweet that his parents were like, look, it doesn't matter if we get it or not. You know, we love you. We're your parents. We, you know, we're here for you. Right. So uh, that, I, to me, that's like, that's all that's important. That's true. Really. You know. That's true. It, nothing, nothing else matters. It's like, whether I get it or not, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, and then we're going to jump back to uh, Picard. We have this uh, great scene where Picard is having a couple drinks and his uh, brother Robert comes in and says, you know, you could get out of control. It's not like that synth hall that you normally drink that you don't get out of control with. And then uh, then he starts asking what happened to John Luke up there. And he goes, I don't really know what happened. I just, they told me, but I don't get it. Um, and Picard is like, so you came coming back here and... Um, you know, for my protection or something like that. And, you know, Picard, you know, Picard just gets angry and storms off and they end up getting into a fist fight in, uh, in the vineyard. And, uh, while they're, after they're punching, then they start laughing because they realize how ridiculous because they're all covered in mud and, uh, you know, they realize it's just silly. But then Picard just starts, you know, breaks down and crying, just saying how f- awful he feels that, he was assimilated by the Borg, and he, you know, all those people were killed. Um, you know, all uh, everything that happened was partly because of him. And there's no way he just couldn't stop it. And he was, no matter how hard I tried to fight him, I just I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't good enough. And uh, Robert is kind of just like, so uh, you're human after all. He says you're going to live with this for a very long time, and uh, you know. And so he picks him up out of the mud and basically says, you know, and he still makes a joke like, I still never liked you. <laughs> yeah. And maybe this this is the scene that makes me not like this episode that much. Really? Okay, well, I want to get into that in a, in a minute. Yeah, cause let's, so let's come back to this. It's the uh, end yeah. of the fourth act there that I'm yeah, really so, feeling like I've got a problem. And we'll talk about it. Let's come back to it. Okay, so uh, then uh, they get her uh, Marie Robert's wife comes in and sees there's mud tra- tracked all through the house, and the brothers are there drinking and singing together, and she's like, "What's happened?" And sees Robert's got little blood up on his forehead where maybe Picard hit him or where he fell down, and were you fighting? He's like, you know, you guys should be ashamed of you, but ashamed of each other, but. Then she realizes that they, whatever was in there, you know, they, they got it out of their systems and they're, they're doing, you know, they're together again and they're talking and things have maybe, uh, found some equilibrium between each other. 
Uh, so that's a, a nice ending there. And then we get Wesley is on the holodeck and he uploads his father's message. And this is just after uh, a couple weeks after uh, he's been born and just a new father trying to come to terms with his son and uh you know what what it means and he's trying to express it to him so and wesley gets that um kind of the uh, private message from his father and you can tell that you know uh it means a lot to him but uh it's still he's having a hard time probably processing uh everything and then um we get that um picard leaves uh robert and his family and uh he, uh, they, there's a, there's a nice, uh, goodbye between him and his brother and, and his, the family. Uh, same thing with Worf. Worf's parents beam, uh, leave. They beam out. And, uh, and then, uh, back at home, we see, uh, their son, uh, Robert's son, Rene, outside, uh, dreaming of starships and being on adventures. And, uh, and so we, sadly enough, we know what happens to Rene in generations. So yeah, it doesn't end well. Doesn't end well for him. But it doesn't end well it's a, for Robert either. No, but it's a it's a it's a sweet scene at the moment. So, um, obviously, like you said, this is sort of like the uh, the bookend of Best of Both Worlds. Kind of like uh, gives a kind of emotional wrap up. Um, so uh, let's let's talk about this. Let's dive into this. Is obviously. Uh, the uh, aftermath of Picard and what happens to him. And we see it all through the rest of the seasons and into the movies that Picard is grappling constantly with his assimilation with the Borg. Right. And and the emotional and the anger and uh, the guilt of what ha- what had happened. What What is your thoughts on that? So, in general, this is critical. This is a critical episode for everything that we have seen since then. They've they've laid out so much that you see in First Contact, and we see it again in. Um, I mean, First Contact definitely, but yes, we'll see one. it. We'll see it again even in places like Emissary from Deep Space Nine. Um, oh yeah, we'll mm-hmm. see it yeah. again. Um, <laughs> yeah. We see it in Scorpion one and two, at okay. and Voyager. I mean, Voyager, it, right? it is all over the place. It's critical right, to. Right, right. I mean, this becomes so pivotal in the, the the in the lore. Best of both worlds one and two is so impactful to the mm-hmm. lore of all of the next gen series. And mm-hmm. obviously, it's going to be impactful on Picard, on the series of Picard, just seeing the trailer. I mean, sure. knowing that we have spoilers, knowing that we have Seven in that, I, I knowing mm-hmm. that we have Q, and knowing that we have a Borg cube of some sort, sure. yeah, we're, we're, we're coming back to this. So yeah. it is critical, and I agree with, 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 um, with Pillar when he says Mike Pillar when he says that this needed to happen this episode needed to happen yeah um, for sure and, I, and I'm glad that Rick allowed it Rick Berman I, you know usually <laughs> Rick dumps these things um, the problem is I do feel kind of like in general this episode's a, a hangers on as far as an episode as far as the feel of it it's all critical. Huh. It's all vital. But there's, it's, uh, it's an epilogue. This is a one-hour epilogue. Is an, it is an epilogue. You're you're absolutely correct. There's yep. no plot to it. Um, there's a one-hour epilogue, um, and and I really have a problem with the fight between Robert and Jean Luc. Okay, let's let's. I I, I want to hear this. So what is what is okay, the so, main? My my biggest problem is I've got a couple of problems with we have it's like a trope and we visited it again in Discovery. I swear this is like a writer's room trope. Right? It's like, oh Aaron, you have wronged me for the last time, so we're going to have to literally duke it out. Now we've mm-hmm. known each other forever, but 
today I'm going to beat on you. Mm-hmm. I mean, really? It's like, I mean, I, my sister and I have had bad days. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the gotcha. last time that I have actually hit my sister, I think wow. I was maybe 12. <laughs> Well, it's a little different. Right? You're a, gr- you're a girl, man. If you had a brother, maybe you'd knock him out once in a while. Maybe. <laughs> but at 50? Yeah, I know. I right? I mean, so so if you think about this, it, this is even more prescient now. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jean-Luc, this is, this is now season four, right? Sure. I'm 47 right now. I am mm-hmm. the same age. As Patrick Stewart was at season one. Mm-hmm. So 48, 49, 50, 51. So this is Jean Luc, this is Patrick Stewart at 51 years old. Now let's take, let's say, my best friend, okay? Because he's mm-hmm. the closest thing I've got to a brother. Sure. Let's say. And let's say that we, I don't know, let's pretend like I'm really ticked off at him. He's ex military, so. You know, it could be let's or he at this point in his life because he's current military right now. But let's say he's ex-military at that point. So let's say he might have just enough of a snoot full to decide to actually get into fisticuffs. Although I can't imagine it. Hmm. A fifty-one-year-old and a fifty-four-year-old deciding mm-hmm. to duke it out. We're gonna break shit. I well, mean, really? It's true, but this is the future, though. So just we're still going to break shit. <laughs> you might, you might, you might. I mean, so I'm not going to deck him. I'm not going to hit him. I'm going to yell at him. I'm going to mm. scream at him. I'm going to call him an asshole. I'm going to call him all kinds of names. I'm going to stomp around. I'm going to probably sling words that I'll regret. I'm going to say things that I won't. That I'll think is a, probably a bad idea. But I'm not going to punch him. Not at 51. At 22, I might have, but not at 51. And I had this same problem when when Michael Burnham decided to, spoilers, to deck, uh, what's his Spock. name? Not Spock, but what's his name from uh, Section 31? Oh, Ash Tyler? No, the other guy. Bald guy, <laughs> the other um, with the beard. Oh gosh, with the beard. Yeah, the well, the, the five o'clock shadow. Um, um, the, you're the, talking the, 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 the guy who's section thirty one. Yeah, the guy who's not a Borg. Um, guy who's not a Borg. Yeah, the, the, everybody keeps saying he's a Borg, but he's not a Borg. Control. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I can't think of his name. Anyway, I can't think of his name. Off same the top thing, of my head right? right? We find mm-hmm. out this big plot point, this critical plot point. And what does she do? She hauls off and punches him, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, and I'm it's like, a bit of extreme. I'm like, I, I wouldn't have punched him, right? I mean, I, 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 it's like we're going a little too far for drama, and and I really because that's that's how I read it. I see it as more as like this is a TV show. We got to put a little conflict in it. We got to you know the conflict's obviously- great, but I would have sat there and said, look, here's the deal. You know, I've. Uh, seized all your bank accounts or you know I don't know I would have done something a little bit more clever than ha ah, pap punch you in the nose you know yeah, I know I, I, I get it but I mean it to me it's it's a couple things like I, I for me I can see uh, like the difference between uh you know what brothers could possibly get because there's a lot of other emotions there it's it, it's but you know, it also brother- doesn't fit the character right Cisco would have punched him. Kirk would have punched but rem- him. But remember, Picard is sitting there drinking wine, so he might have got a little like, little, Dude, little goofy. Might a lot of, a little you, can, out of you can load me up with a ton of wine, and I still won't punch you. It's know, it's a part you, you of saw our him, character. You saw him in tapestry, so you see what he does when he's out of control. That's true. Gets in a, gets there in is a a, there is a certain of amount of that in tapestry. So he's got he's got a little bit of a wild child kind of side of him. So well, he, yeah, he really, but I was a totally different critter at 22 as well. I agree. Yeah, and maturity changes you so that you're not, you know, swinging your fists every time you get angry. <laughs> right. But you have 20 years of resentment between each other, maybe more, maybe 30 or more. 
uh, years of resentment or, or, or maybe your whole life of resentment towards somebody. Uh, it's not that you don't, you know, see them as your brother, but you're more just like, you know, Robert thinks, uh, you know, Picard's a pompous ass, that he totally is throwing away a tradition of his family, whereas, you know, Picard sees Robert as just like this, you know, Luddite. Yeah. You know, it's just like, you know, you just, well, you he don't definitely care. sees him as a Luddite. Luddite, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, I mean, and, you know, he's stubborn and, and, and all that. So, you know, I, I, it's a part of me is sort of like, I, I don't. Is it realistic? Maybe not, but um, I, I get it, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Well, um, and obviously, you know, I have a lot of faith in Ron Moore um, when Ron writes, and what Ron writes, and right. so Ron thought this fit. But well, you needed, but you needed that breakdown that you know here. Well, I totally, I totally think I could have achieved this as as a writer. I could have achieved this without pushing that fight. You know what I mean? I guess. I mean, I, I, guess. I could. I could have gotten. I could have gotten Jean Luc to the point where he broke down with just the words, because the words that Robert are saying here are absolutely painful. Yeah. Right. I mean, the things he's saying hurt, and it mm-hmm. kills me to watch this scene because mm-hmm. Robert is just. Digging Insensi- in. Yeah, he's, in, he's insensitive. He's being a dick, and he know. really is. And he's digging in hard, and yeah. and he's doing what brothers do. Brothers are horrible, and I know that. Mm-hmm. My my sister can hurt pretty hard too, um, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's all good. I I that that I totally believe. I I was good with everything right up until the fist was thrown, and I don't yes. know. Yeah, it, yeah. I don't it's my know. Favorite. <laughs> You're like that's my favorite part. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's that I have always felt that Patrick Stewart's portrayal of Jean Luc is not an action hero, and maybe that's what I'm having a problem with. Is mm-hmm. that because I also sort of have a problem a little bit with like Chain of Command one and two, not in the same way. Hmm. Um, Chain of Command one and two, where we've got where we've got Patrick Stewart being going spy. through, yeah, yeah being spy a spy, kind of and that's yeah, right. it's not it's not that he did a bad job, it's that that's not what Picard does, and the the thing that makes Chain of Command brilliant, of course, is that. Oh my the, God! There are four the lights. lights. <laughs> there are lights. Yeah, how and, many lights are up there? And I mean, you can sit. I mean, that's that's a tears moment right there. There are right. four lights, and you know you can and just rolling Patrick Stewart through that, and he is so good at it. Mm-hmm. Oh sure, Sir yeah. Patrick can do amazing things, but still, again, I still have a little bit of a problem with why are we turning Patrick Stewart? Why are we turning Captain Picard into a spy? He's not. Um, that's not what Picard is. Um, and and I, I, I portray, I, I perceive, I don't mean to keep cutting you off, um, mm-hmm. but I am. Um, <laughs> but I perceive like Cisco. Yeah. See, now Cisco, yeah. Cisco's he's gritty. Different. He's yeah. gritty. And he's sort of a fallen angel anyway. They've had sure. him have problems before. He's got disciplinary action problems. They're sticking him on the ass end of the universe so right. you know if he if they were to say cisco go out there and run this mission where you might get killed okay i could see that but patrick stewart's a boy scout see i i see him as a man who's refined himself uh, to a Boy Scout, and maybe he, uh, maybe he's not as crazy as a as a Cisco or or a Kirk, um, but I see him still. There's a, there's a side of him that's a little wild, and that he 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 made himself a different man over the years um, to be you know the best captain of all Starfleet to get the flagship of Starfleet, you know right. the Enterprise, right? Um, and but there's still a, a wild side to him, and we do see it once in a while come out. Maybe not in, a, in, in fisticuffs, but he does every once in a while do something totally uh, out of left field, and he's not afraid to take action either. 
No, if he needs I don't to. feel like he he's afraid to take action. I feel like he's calculated. He is calculated. You're 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 totally correct about that. But and so I feel he, like whenever. But when we get to this scene, I, I feel that here you like I've said before, like he's been drinking. There's twenty years plus, maybe more, of resentment and anger between the two brothers, and then his brother's just needling him, and then obviously he's coming off the the tail end of this horrible experience with Which the board. Which is effectively being raped. Right. I mean his body's literally has been disfigured and mutilated. Right. Uh so, you know, to me. You know, Robert is a jackass that's pushing him that doesn't, when he's coming home, he should have been open arms like, you know, first of all, thank you for fucking saving Earth. Uh, secondly, you know, I, I know, I don't know everything, but I can just offer you, you know, kindness for, you know, as a, as a family, but he never even did that. So Robert is just a fucking asshole. You know. You know what else I also think I don't like about this? What's that? I mean, okay, yeah, I'm willing to go for all of that. And, and maybe mm-hmm. that's not necessarily. Michael Pillar was started the premise of this entire thing by saying Jean Luc was raped. Okay. When Picard breaks down here at mm-hmm. the end of Act Four. Sure. He says he feels he should have done more to resist, but he wasn't strong or good enough. Mm-hmm. I've known rape victims, and these are words that I've heard them say, right? Okay. I mean, like literal rape victims who've, you know, I mean, and I, obviously I'm talking about female rape victims in this instance, not male rape, rape victims necessarily, uh-huh. though, though obviously rape victims can be either gender. Um, but in this case, these are words that I feel like, and I feel like Robert's response is, well, I guess you're normal then. Yeah. You know, yeah, not, but- not, holy shit, dude, you've been raped. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but Robert is a dickhead. I know he is. He establishes this. I know. It, it, well, no, no, no. And, and I guess my whole thing is we have an opportunity here. In Star Trek, in in our in our show, in our show, mm-hmm. to actually explore something about rape, where we could talk about trauma, real sure. trauma, legit trauma, and what character did we give Picard Robert, Robert. <laughs> to to face off against this? Not somebody who would say, "Dude." Dude, come here. Let me let me let me help you heal. Let's let's right. get over this. You you were the victim here. It's okay. You aren't at fault, which is what every rape victim needs to hear. I know, but I I, I mean instead you and I, instead yeah, Robert would, is like so. Like, you're, I guess you're normal. <laughs> you're like, no, Robert, I, get it, I just I get need it. to like. Kick you in the nuts, there, dude. I know he he is a kick you in the nuts kind of guy. But I I was going to say you and I are around the same age, and we're from a generation where, um, like I I do I also know a few people, uh, unfortunately, that were you know raped, and um, I know of two incidents where the parents were very not accepting of it. Right, they were just like they were just like. If one chose to ignore it, like like it never happened, like you know, no, 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 that's that didn't happen. Like they just literally would not hear it because their daughter just they can't even ma- imagine that happening, right? And the other other one, they just were just like you know, um, it just shut shut down conversation because they, you know, um, they didn't have the emotional fortitude to, to handle, handle that it. kind of stuff, and. Um, yeah, it's sad, but it's true. Right. I think we, and, I, and think got, it's just, I think, I think as society we've changed. I think we've moved ahead, uh, not a hundred percent, obviously, but I think we've got to the point where people at least know that this person needs help. Right, and it's not just physical help; they need psychological help after being treated this way. But there's aspects know? of this 
which if you look at this in the long con, there are pieces of this that are all here, right? What does yeah. Cisco do to Picard? He oh, victim shit. blames him. Yeah, absolutely. He's totally victim shaming him. And yeah. he's been victim shaming him through all of Star- Emissary. And Starfleet won't even let him in the fight against the Borg because they're afraid that he's going to switch sides or something. Right, which is also victim shaming him. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's the it's the it's the science fiction effect of what was what was he wearing? I mean, you know, yeah, we've, we've exactly. got like that entire effect going on right there. And I guess what I feel like is I'm like, dude, we had Ron Moore on this script. We had Ron Moore on this script. Where did he drop the ball? Did he have more in here? And I guess that's what I feel like. I feel like this... Sometimes I can pick up in a script where someone else has written in. You know what I mean? And I feel like Ron had a different plan for this scene. And I sense that there was something else going on here. And... Rick came in and said, "No, we got to change this. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. You're not gonna. You're not gonna do this. We're not going this way. This isn't where it's going to go. You're not taking this into rape. You're going to back out of this here now, because that I feel like would have made this entire thread make so much more impact." I, I, I agree. And, like, honestly, like, the scenes with Wesley and even the scenes with Worf, as sweet as they are, you know, it's like you, you probably could have skipped all that. This could have just been a purely uh, Picard, and we could have gotten more into the relationship. And uh, I, I, I understand the device of the fist fight in the vineyard as to uh, evoke emotion. Um, I get that vehicle, but yeah. you could have done that if you had a little more time and stopped cutting over to Worf or cutting over to Wesley. Right. And really, I think I'm not irritated. I think I'm irritated with the fist fight like all the Trekkies nowadays are irritated with the Klingons. It's not really – that's not really my problem. I think I'm mm. I'm redirecting. I think mm. I think my real problem is I wanted so much more out of this episode. And I never got hmm. it. Interesting. I, I it's funny. I, I'm, I, I do get the, the correlation with the rape, you know, kind of thing. But honestly, I, I still see. I don't know. I, I get this whole. I get a whole different take on this because I feel so much that. I don't know how to ex- describe it. That this, uh, he has this estranged brother that he hasn't seen in years, and that he, uh, is trying to reconnect, but. It's failing to do so. Well, and and, and, and then I, and I, at the that. very end, he sort of connects with him, but just for a moment when he sees that his brother's weak again. Right. Well, and and you've got and that that's another one of those things that makes total correlation too. I've seen that as well. I mean, someone gets raped, they go back to their family, they go mm-hmm. back to home base, they go back to zero spot, and they right. run into. The old chatter. Nobody, nobody knows how to handle it. You, I think you were saying this before. You were talking about a friend who everybody just either avoids it or doesn't want to talk about it, or or it's an uncomfortable thing, or so they or, just totally they don't even bring it up. They don't bring it up, or whatever. That, well, that that in a way is a denial. It, it denies that you did it. It denial it denies that it happened to you, and and in a way we've got that here. I mean, that's here. Um, Absolutely. You, you totally have Robert denying. Um, and, you know, and I think the whole point is that I think that Picard wanted to come back to Dad. But Dad's sure. not here anymore. So right. Picard ends up with Robert, which is about <laughs> the best he can get. Sure. And Robert's a jerk. And so yeah. he's trying with Robert. And, I mean, I, I, I mean the setup here is great. Absolutely. Ron Moore did a great job. Ron setting it up beautifully. And I feel like... Ugh. The d- the delivery wasn't what you wanted. Like, and it's so close. It's so, so close. And like I said, 
like I said in the in the outset, it's not that I hate this episode. I do not hate this episode, but I feel like this is eighty percent. Hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, it could have been. It could have been one of those that we still talk about today. You know, I we talk I about to- measure of a man and and the inner light and family. Sure. You know what sure. I mean? I. I get it, and I and I'm not I'm not uh, I don't I'm not disagreeing with you because I think in that light very much so, you know it's it's like one of those things that are like um, it falls short. But to me, uh, the emotional residents uh, resi- not residents <laughs> resi- <laughs> all those people who are emotional living in your house. <laughs> yes, you know, the residents of my house are the emotions. Um, no, uh, the 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 the. The, the, what I walk away with right. is is very strong, and I really feel uh, I, I, I it's it's it jars something for me. And yeah. you know, I, I have I have two brothers. I have I I do have an estranged brother that I I do not talk to, uh, not by my choice, but purely by his. I have uh, you know uh, um, my mother, unfortunately, totally estranged to me. Right. She doesn't want to have anything to do with me, so I get it. I get it a lot, and uh, it's it, it's hard. It's very very difficult. So uh, to me, you know, it's um, this means it, a it, lot. This means it means different. a lot. Yeah, it's a different feeling, and and yes, I I do see the uh, I do see what you're coming from, and I, it totally makes sense. And it's not that I didn't make that connection, but I didn't make it as strongly as you did. You, sure. You, you drilled down deep into, like, why are they doing it this way? So. Oh, yeah. Well, and, I mean, and, and again, I, you know, it's not that this, this episode has zero value. It has a lot of value. I really love the whole part with Jack Crusher, with the exception of the fact that I hate the fact that they took away the turtlenecks. Oh my I know. god, people. I know. Isn't it the worst? The monster maroons do not look good without the turtlenecks. And and they don't and they don't have the um the belt. They don't have the belt. The belt's missing. Oh god, people. And they did that and they, you see that with yesterday's enterprise and, oh and my god. Uh, there's there's more than one we oh uh tapestry we and see tapestry. it as well. Yeah. Oh, it and looks like, horrible. What? It just looks like, horrible. What? Why yeah, what is doing? going on? Yeah, why would you destroy that beautiful <laughs> the monster maroons are so gorgeous, and they anyway, are. short of that part, which you know, okay, so I've made my statement. Um, mm. <laughs> short of that mm. part, um, you know, other than that, I love all the pieces with Wes, and I mm-hmm. dig the pieces with Worf and his family, because, like I said, now having lived in another culture, I find it fascinating to me to watch the parallels between when I have Japanese guests here, when I'm in Japan, etc., 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 and how mm-hmm. how the parallels are drawn between all of the, the wharf slash, you know, J- uh, Klingon culture things and, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm not just picking on the Japanese. I just happen to know but Japanese def- culture really, yeah, really that's what well. Yeah, you relate to. Right, and right. so, yeah, so I really relate to it. Um... So it's like, it's funny how, you know, there's some serious parallels there. So I always enjoy it. And I always enjoy watching Worf's family um, every time. And and just imagine what would happen if we had adopted some, you know, poor Japanese kid. (laughs) And, you know, know, some some Japanese kid who's trying desperately to find his connection back to Japan. And you know, you know, and just imagine like him going through all this and going, you just wouldn't understand. Yeah, I you know, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I could just see that. I could see that. That totally. Yeah. So all of that rings so true mm-hmm. to me, um, and that makes some sense. And it, it's it's really cool. And, and I've always loved. I love the actors that they picked for Sergey oh, and Helen. They are Rajinko. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are some of the best. Of, uh, uh, you know, some of the best characters. Um, the parents. You know, some we always talk about the family um, here, but uh, with the, you know, we, when we talk about family, I always want to just point out some of the best characters in this show are the parents. Oh, yeah, you talk about the Rajenkos and you talk about Loxana, um, because the truth of the matter is, she wasn't the most stellar of actresses in Toss, and I know I am making 
some kind of horrible, horrible statement. Yeah, by you're, saying you might that. be but crucified. As soon. nurse, I know. I'm, as nurse right. chapel and as number one, she wasn't stellar. Right. And it, and I know it was because totally she was having an affair with Jean, and we know that everybody knows this. This is not a sure. secret. But she shone as oh, Roxana. she's wonderful, yeah. And and really, that was like a, st- a stellar moment of her career as Loxana. Yeah. And so, some of the some of the, I mean, she was irritating for a while. And then she stopped being irritating and started. My just my wonderful. favorite actually is uh, her uh, episodes with Odo. They yes. are so so and Odo. heartwarming and hilarious at the same time. So the beautiful, beautiful the the di- uh, dynamics between the two characters. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and she does a good, wonderful, wonderful job. So I mean, you know, shout out to all the parents. Yeah. 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 You I'm know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a parent too. But I mean, shout out to the to the to the parents here. We've got we've got Wesley's dad. We've got Sergey and Helena Rajenko, and uh, you know it's we've got a lot of these things. Um, we've got Jack sure. Crusher. Is the, I, I don't know why I couldn't suddenly pull up Jack Crusher in my Jack. head. Such a such a critical Picard's character. friend. Picard's friend. Um, well, as we're doing, let's transition right now. I, I, I want to get your hot take on the Picard series that's coming up. Um, obviously, that's it's exciting. Uh, like you said, we're getting Borg. We're getting the Romulans. Um, there, you know, or, uh, like a disenfranchised Picard. Um, so yeah. what, what was, what's your feelings? What's your takes? What's your hopes? What's your fears? Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, boy, I'm worried about that dog. <laughs> anyway, that dog um, ain't gonna make it. <laughs> that dog's not gonna make it to the end of the show. Dogs don't go in space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, Archer. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, my 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 thought is, I'm I'm looking at this going well. Uh, when I look at the show, my first thought on this is, I'm I'm worried about. The Trekkies, <laughs> because you know, are they going to accept this show at all, or are we just going to have more Division. discovery whining? Yeah, yeah. Because I have already decided a long time ago that I was going to stop prejudging. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that has made Discovery so much better. Yeah, for you're me, you're right about that. Absolutely. I mean, after you watch it, you might have something to say, but you. you well, and there are some episodes of Discovery I'm not terribly fond of. Sure, yeah. And and I'm not going to talk about the second of the J.J. Abrams movies at all. <laughs> um, it is anathema. Yeah. I'm not even. I'm not even discussing that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm. Even I'm though there, I like I'm, you, like parts of it, but not all of it. Yeah, even though it's got Benedoodle Cumberboodle mm-hmm. um, in it, and and I do like him. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just I'm not even accepting that movie. Yeah. I'm just not. Yeah, I, I have issues with it too, and I've expressed it more than once on the show. <laughs> yep, <laughs> but I didn't prejudge anything from even the Kelvin timeline, and I didn't prejudge Discovery, and I've come out enjoying both of those a whole lot more. It's 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 a lot better than than I. Um, it, it, it's made me as a Trekkie. Uh, I feel like a much more relaxed individual. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and my biggest complaint to Discovery really was that the Klingon ships were not, in fact, Klingon ships. You know, when we said D7, it looked like some kind of, you know, housefly. And I was like, no, really, guys. So, huh. uh, but they resolved that, and I got a D7 that looked like a D7. Yeah, they were basically happy. flying Zendrati ships, uh into yeah. into uh, into battle. Exactly. I don't even know what they were doing, but that's okay. Uh-huh. It's okay. Uh-huh. Um, we, but we, we got it. I, I I have my quibbles about discovery, and you know we we've talked about each episode, and I I thought I thought second season turned out. I thought it started off very strong. I think it fell down a couple times, and I think the time travel thing got a little muddy. Um, but 
I, there's a lot of things I did like about it, so I, I don't want to like shit on it completely. It's just I, I think there's they, I think the writing could have been sharper in certain aspects. Yeah. Um, but with I'll even go for that. It, it, but but if you look at it from the point of view of, um, you you know if you look at it from the point of view of if wishes were horses <laughs> or code of code of honor or, mm-hmm. I mean, you know anything from. From the first seasons, second seasons of any of the Star Treks, right, and their contemporaries, um, really, it's not doing bad at all. It's rolling pretty well, right? Because I actually can say that I liked sixty percent or seventy percent of the episodes of Discovery really well, um, and and then like. Magic to make the sanest man was insane and off the hook. Yeah, yeah. And you know what I mean? And like, so there were like one or two that were really good. Really good, yeah. And then second season, Pike was incredible. Sure. And that whole arc with Pike to loop it back into the menagerie was just brilliant. Yeah, it was beautiful. And, and so, you know, I'm like, okay, see. Now we're working it. Mm-hmm. So by the time we got to second season on on Discovery, we were at what I would have construed as more closer to third season of TNG, maybe even fourth season of Deep Space Nine. So well, they're moving faster, I feel, than the other guys, their contemporaries. But we also are, you know, uh, like... 20, 30 years into the future of uh, television writing and production. Yeah. So we're, we're in a different world, I mean, obviously. So um, yeah. I, 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 I give you that. And yes, there are some shitty episodes. I mean, there's some shitty episodes of shows I like right now that, um, you know, I'm just not crazy about. It's like, eh, it's an okay episode. Like, there's Game of Thrones uh, episodes where I'm like, I could have gone without maybe 80% of the episode, you know, kind of thing. Um, but so, but getting back to Picard, um, <laughs> we've rabbit holed again. again. I know you're shocked again. Yes. <laughs> but what did you, what did you, what was your, what was your thoughts on that? I mean, like, obviously, you know, we, we have a little bit to go on, but not a lot. Um, but we can speculate and, uh, wonder what's going to happen. Well, my feeling, um, looking at, looking at Picard, I'm, well, first of all, I am extremely excited for this, mm-hmm. but I'm trying not to prejudge. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's not any better to prejudge positively. Yes, it is to if you hype it too much, negatively. then you'll be let down. You know, yeah, I'll be let down. Um, oh man, I I could not tell you how. I, I mean, I think I I think I burst into tears seeing Jerry Ryan. Oh wow! Um, I mean, I was just like, oh god, look, it's seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's like, it, you know, just seeing Seven of Nine was just awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I knew they were going to do stuff. And then, you know, you just, how can you not be just sobbing whenever you see Data and, and all of that at the end of that trailer? Right. So, I mean, we've got Data, we've got B4, we've got Seven of Nine. I mean, it's it's clear we, we're we're operating with a great dearth of all of our characters from this era. And we are going to get, know, if supposedly get Riker and Troy. Yeah, we're going to get Riker and Troy somewhere along the line too, yep. which makes some sense. Sure. So, I mean, I, I'm fascinated. But then, of course, there's a little bit of trepidation here. I mean, you know, it's like I think it's going to be fascinating to look at any situation where you take a character like Picard and pull him out of his element. Um, he's no longer Captain Picard. Sure. He's now just Jean-Luc Picard. Right. Who runs some little vineyard in France. Sure. And now all of a sudden he's got some mission and he's got to go back in and say, hey guys, um, like, can I have a spaceship? And they'll say, no. Right, right, right. <laughs> no. And so he's like... He's like, but, but, but it's important. And they'll say, no. Right. And, you know, I mean, this is going to be fascinating. But I also see potential for a lot of, you know, ugly here. You know, and Jean-Luc Picard comes in and says, I want a spaceship. And they say, no. Hmm. And then he goes, 
Well, then I shall get a spaceship myself. <laughs> and somehow manages to get, like, a super spaceship. And I'll be like, really? <laughs> you know, it's like... I know. And there's even but rumors out... But if jalopy, yeah. it's going to be awesome. Well, we, you know, we, we, there's rumors that he... I mean, this is totally a speculation I've read, that they might give him, uh, give him the Stargazer again. That would be awesome. Like, in, I mean, in that, a jalopy. And, and that would be a jalopy. It would be totally a jalopy. The bridge that I'm seeing him on, though, is not yeah, it's the Stargazer. It's, it's not the so. Stargazer, right. But we don't know. We don't know what's happening so far. Um, and um, I have a feeling, this is my this is my pet theory. I'm going to throw, throw it out to you. I have a theory that this girl that's in trouble, that Picard's trying to save, is actually, uh, was to be a, a Borg queen. And, okay. and that, you know, they are trying to use her or recruit her or bring her into it. Obviously, the, the Romulians are experimenting with Borg technology of some sort. So um, we're seeing something to do with the Romulans mixing with the Borg. Yes, so, that makes some sense. So. I mean, because we saw a Borg cube that was damaged or dead. Right. And we see these Borgs, and there was that prison where they had some scene and said, like, you know, there's been so many days bef- uh, without assimilation. Without an assimilation. Right. Yes. Right. So, that was clever. So, I mean, there's there's a lot going on here. And obviously, I don't know the full story behind it, but this obviously ties into the J.J. Um, Kelvin side where Picard is supposed to have something to do with the... Uh, Helping uh, after the uh, Romulan uh, st- uh, star um, went supernova, and he mm-hmm. and he rescues it with a rescue armada, but it, we don't know really what happens from there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of gathering that that makes that that seems like that's what's going on to some degree. I don't know. I had also heard a rumor that it was you know that 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 the, the girl was. Data's daughter or something like that. But I like your theory a lot better because that makes more sense that you know, if it's if it's a Borg queen, then she would say, "Do you recognize me?" Right. That would make sense. Right. Yeah. I I mean, that's pure theory. Pure theory. I mean, no, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, but it's it's that's a very educated theory. Um because the the one guy was like, "She's the destroyer. She'll, you know, the it's some I think some Romulan guy was just screaming that out, so but anyways, I, I'm, I, I'm ex- I'm very much, I'm very much looking forward to seeing where they go. I'm trying not to set myself up too much. Yes, it's very hard, and um, it's just one of those things. Here, I, I'm excited for it, but I'm also like a little like hesitant that they could really make the Picard character crash and burn and make make a terrible story. It's it is possible. It is possible, and uh, but I don't know if it'd be possible. With Sir Patrick on the writing staff, I'm curious. But do we know that? Possible. Do we know that Sir Patrick is a good writer? Probably. We don't know. He just, he might be a fantastic <laughs> artist. I mean, there's plenty of. I'm sure you know. There's plenty of great artists or great actors too that aren't writers. That's absolutely true. And you are absolutely spot on. I mean, the only thing I'm hoping is that he would have a better idea who the Picard character is supposed to be. Since he embodied that character for so long. So, um, I don't know. I, it's exciting. And this is why we're, we're doing these look backs on the Picard and, uh, especially the next generation episodes. Um, so. It's fun to me. I, I, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun looking back at these episodes. And, um, you know, a lot of times we jump around and we've been actually doing a lot of outside other sci-fi stuff as well. So going back to TNG has been a lot of fun for me. Well, uh, should we wrap this up and then, uh, you know, uh, let people listen to their other podcasts that they might have? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go back to your other podcasts? I mean, you've got to go back to your other podcasts someday. Someday you have to. You can't always just listen to me and Guy. I know. I mean, we would love it if you stayed. Uh, but you could. <laughs> yes, we could. But we know you have to be moving on. Um, as always, you can find our show at Synthaholics.com. Uh, you can also find us uh, and uh, the Facebook pages. We have a Facebook page at Synthaholics. Uh, we also you can join our group, Synthaholics uh, 
uh, Facebook uh, slash Synthaholics uh, groups. Uh, you can look us up there. It's great. Um, and Twitter, we are in Synthaholics Duo. That's our Twitter handle. I'm at Blackbird2004. Uh, David Duncan is at David underscore J underscore Duncan. And Holly is at Lunar Thistle. Guy, you were at uh, GS Davis Art at Twitter? Yep. I'm at GS Davis Art pretty much everywhere. You can find me at jsdavisart.com. And you can find me on, on uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And pretty much everywhere. I mean, even Deviant Art at GS nice, Davis. Art. Very nice. Uh, definitely go check out his work. Uh, I do look forward to uh, Witches of Flames. I know that I've seen some of the artwork. It looks uh, actually absolutely incredible. I'm a big fan of your work, uh, and uh, I must say that your line work is impeccable, sir. So uh, we, we talked about that before we started recording. So. Um, and uh, our music, uh, f- beginning music, the intro music is done by Dave Wilkes. He is not on anything, so don't worry. You'll never find him. He's under a bridge somewhere. And uh, we also have uh, Warp 11. Uh, Warp 11 is uh, does our outro music. And you can, they have, not a GoFundMe, it's a Kickstarter for, for their. So look them up for their Kickstarter. They have a new album coming out that they want to kickstart. So look them up if you enjoy that music. Um, also, uh, please uh, go to Apple iTunes, rate and review us there. Five stars would be nice. Say something nice about us uh, so other people can see us. And also, uh, you can go to our Patreon page. Patreon forward slash Synthaholics if you want to throw some money our way to help us continue uh, basically keeping the lights on in the podcast shack. And then, as always, if you can't do any of those things, we totally understand. But a great free way you can help us is by sharing the show, telling friends about the show, uh, let your neighbors know, let your dog know. Uh, you know, let your let your brother Robert know who doesn't like podcasts because he thinks it's uh, too convenient, too easy. But let him know. Maybe 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 he'll download us sometime. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to say, guy? Before we sign off? No, I think that's pretty good. Other than uh, live long and prosper to all of you. Yes, please live long and prosper, one and all. You're the best drinking friend